The Order of Light presents... We Are The Disclosure, Episode 19. With our guest, Dr. Daniel Seda, as we explore the extraterrestrial phenomena. Now is the time for those with experiences to speak. We are not waiting for the disclosure. We are the disclosure. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to We Are The Disclosure. I'm Robert Earl White. And I'm Josh Myota. With our special guest, Dr. Daniel A. Sada, PhD. How's it going, brother? It's wonderful. Thank you. Good to be here, guys. Yes, absolutely. And together... We are the Disclosure. So, let's get to the show. We are the Disclosure. Welcome back to the channel, everyone. Episode 19. I know Josh and I, we've been away for a while, but make no mistake, we are back, and we are more ready than ever for today's guest, Dr. Daniel A. Seda, which has an amazing book, which we will be talking about right here, as you can see, The Chronicles of the Octorian Envoy, A Starseed's Journey into the Great Awakening. Phenomenal book that we will be talking about. Along with that, Daniel has a phenomenal story, a background, he has a very um, expanded uh, education all over the spectrum, all over the place in the country. He spent a lot of time learning, researching, reading, 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 reading. And along with that, he's had a really incredible journey with some experiences that has really altered and shaped his fabric of reality, I guess we could call it. And uh, with that being said, Daniel, uh, welcome to the show. And we would love to just hear a little bit about your background, some of your education, and all of that before we get into all the good stuff. <laughs> all right, sounds good. Uh, you know, my name is Daniel Seda. Uh, let's see. So um, I got my PhD in transpersonal psychology in 2021, graduated from Sophia University, uh, spent uh, several years at the California Institute of Integral Studies out in San Francisco. And so with transpersonal psychology, we deal with lots of this cool stuff that you guys and we talk about all the time, right? ET contact, mediumship, um, you know, psychic phenomena, you know, uh, anything from, you know, uh, ghosts to, uh, to, to spirituality. You know, oftentimes in the field of psychology, they tend to deal much more with sort of like the psyche or or one's inner world per se, solely dedicated more to cognition, faculties, and perhaps also emotions. But, you know, there's so much more to a human being, and we all know that, um, taking into consideration that which is not quite fully understood um, and bringing more of the subjective experiences into the mix as... um, uh, methods of we could call it qualia. I do talk about and that in the uh, the book. Um, but yeah, finding opportun- finding ways in which we can measure that which is purported to be seemingly Im- immeasurable. So that's- Me- metaphysics. Would you sure. say it's metaphysical? The education overall. If there was you know paranormal, extraterrestrial, just outside of the uh, public <laughs> scientific box of expl- explanations. You have studied the opposite end of that. You know, the things we don't have answers for, what could those answers possibly be, right? Yes. And also with that, utilizing much more of the newer sciences with, of course, a mixture of ancient wisdom and finding validity in both of those spectrums and trying to seek some nice balance there. Because as we all know, um, the scientific community, quote unquote, the mainstream scientific community, um, has been, I think, run amok with a lot of, gosh, how do we even say this non-judgmentally? Um, uh, Close-mindedness. Perfect. I was just saying stoppage. <laughs> That's a much better word. Yes. I mean, the scientific method in general is open-minded, right? It's it's constantly questioning, being curious. Finding- Hypothesis. Yes. Which is just a guess. It doesn't mean it's right, but all facts 
at some point or another throughout history has been based off of a guess, a hypothesis, which becomes a theory. fact. So, yeah, or becomes a theory. So we must ask those hypotheses. We must ask. Absolutely. I love it. Yeah, and we do talk about that in the, the Chronicles book where... Um, it's based upon a great deal of research from all of our fantastic whistleblowers within the community, but also to speaking with my Arcturian guides as well and finding ways in which I can try and uh, disseminate information in a, in a respectful manner, um, as well as find creative avenues with which to bring this truth to the public. Now, I will say a great deal of it does have, you know, my, my, a bit of my story in it as well. Uh, I don't want to say too much about the book, but I mean, it's placed in a particular area in the United States and he's a professor and he taught college at a particular university, you know, and I, I did those things and um, I was able to utilize, I think you're the first person I'm telling this to, but I was able to utilize um, a great deal of my, um, uh, my work uh, in preparation to teach classes every day, every week. Um, for the book. So a lot of the stuff that he's teaching is literally stuff that I wrote and, you know, my presentations and my slideshows and things for class. So that is something that most people don't know. So I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, you bring up a great point. You know, although this is a, you know, a, a story created, mm -hmm. it's based off of your actual personal experiences. Mm -hmm. It's based off a lot of the great people and the information that's in this book is no different as Elena Dana's information, Dr. Michael Sala, Alex Collier, so many others. It's actual information. A good way to describe it is like Elena Dana's book, Resilience. It's a science fictional book, but she took real facts and information and kind of wrapped that all up. And uh, if it's all right, Daniel, I would love to read the back print to give everyone an idea of this book chronicles of an octorian envoy which something i want to point out before i let everyone know what this book is about mm -hmm. um you know you're in contact with the blues yeah you know <laughs> um the beings my mother talked about she called them the blues they're, they're not called the blues that was just our you know backcountry folk ignorance of not understanding the beings we're communicating with but um yeah they're octorians very loving positive beings and i just want to uh read this outline of this book uh an absent-minded professor is caught between two worlds when a strange visitor arrives bearing messages from the great beyond through a series of remarkable encounters, Dr. Charles Forthright learns to cope with the reality that seems all too bizarre, yet oddly familiar. Huh. Mm -hmm. Charles' journey of self-acceptance during a perilous time in Earth's history inspires a new era of spiritual warriors dedicated to advancing consciousness for the ultimate sake of humanity. Whew. Woo! Mm, and awesome. I've been I've been reading this book, and it, in my two cents of this book, and what I think makes it really, really awesome, you see a constant battle mm. of this professor in this book who has been taught in the mainstream science logic of university. Uh, a equals B. Don't ask about Z. A mm. equals B. You know, like that kind of way of thinking. And this professor, you know, comes into contact with things that is just completely outside of everything he was ever taught. And you will read about the internal struggle of, you know, that, you know, traditionalist science community versus the unknown. Mm. We'll call it the X. You know, the unknown parts of science that everyone's trying to figure out in some shape or form. And it's a beautiful story how he kind of debates himself. And as he's teaching, right, he's teaching people, but the curriculum he's teaching doesn't necessarily go with the curriculum that he's being taught from universal consciousness. So yeah. what does someone in that position do? You know, how, how do you combat that? And that struggle 
is defined and captured wonderfully in this book, Chronicles of an Octorian Envoy. Definitely, everyone, check it out. Uh, Daniel's information will be in the description, and you will be able to check out his website and get in contact with him. So with, with that being said, you know, Daniel, if you could, um, for anyone that does read this book or check it out, what is one of the big takeaways that you would say they can benefit from this book? Great question. So um, I have seen, you know, um, we have some mutual friends, you know, in social media and stuff, and I have seen sort of a, um, understandably so, kind of a, a backlash against individuals who have um, higher degrees of education because it's almost perceived as though they really don't know the truth, right? Which is totally understandable because so much of our educational system is extreme indoctrination. I have been extremely lucky with my guides throughout my entire educational journey because they're always ping me. In fact, I'm getting chills right now. Uh, they ping me all the time when I was in class. I was that kid who'd be like, I'm sorry, how did you know? How, how do we know that that is the case? And, you know, I'd ask those very probing questions, even in a, a budgeting class in my master's degree. I have a, one teacher who still says, darn you, Dan, for asking that question. I'll never forget that as long as I live. Um, but in general, it's just recognizing star seeds in general. We recognize when things are off. We recognize when there's a frequency of untruth. And we also recognize when there's frequencies of truth, right? So um, I feel like we're, we have heightened senses um, more so than most who, who, um, who kind of adhere more to the traditional ways of thinking. So in general, um, one thing that is important for a takeaway for this book is that this character, Dr. Charles Forth, right? Yes, he's a, he's a professor, but he is an every man. He's an every person. Um, many of us struggle with, um, you know, our place in the world. We struggle with um, family. We struggle with um, loss, grief, uh, heartache. Um, all of us. All, all of us. Mm -hmm. All of this is encapsulated in the book through this individual. The human support. experience. Yes. The human experience. Yes. yes. And doing so... Um, and this beautiful grappling with what do we know innately and then how does that interplay with what we are taught about what the world is supposed to be with then our internal guidance as to what really the world perhaps is and could and can be. So all of those trifectas are, are, are interplayed there in the book. <laughs> yeah, that's a wonderful point that you're bringing up too. I it can be a lot, just like you were saying, we, we all go through these things. And even those of us who are star seeds, who are hybrids, who mm -hmm. are contacted with beings, oftentimes we struggle with understanding this phenomena no different than people that are completely unaware. You know, just yep. because we see an extraterrestrial does not mean that we understand it. Yep. why it's there, where it's coming from. Just because we see a UFO in the sky, we don't know who the pilot is. We don't know what's going on. It's the logical processing of this human experience and all the amazing um, unexplained things that come with that, mm -hmm. uh, all spectrums of the emotions. Yeah. And um, it, it's, it's an incredible book. I really encourage everyone to... Uh, check it out. Uh, there's uh, for a, put it put it this way: anyone that has read a gift from the stars mm. or Michael Sala's work, yeah. you know Red Dragon, his books, all or that. Alex Collier's book, yeah, yeah. Alex Collier's book. If you have read those books and you read this book, it will be a different book to you mm. because when he brings up these species and mention. And he's going over them. If you've read these other books, you already know what is up. So when it's dropped in this book, you know where it's going and what's happening. So it's a great book to add to the collection. If you are a fan of Elena Danan, Alex Collier, Dr. Michael Sala, and all of their phenomenal books that all of them have. Even like, uh, you know, you got Tony Rodriguez. 
you know, you got Jean, you know, so many others. And this is just a fantastic story of their information coming from a professor's mind, that logical scientific mind. It's great. Definitely check it out. Now, uh, leaking over, but before we get into that, Josh, do you have any questions specifically about the book? Maybe something, you know, Josh hasn't read the book yet. Mm -hmm. So maybe you will have some questions, Josh, that some of our fans and friends will have. Mm -hmm. Uh, What promoted you to write the book? Ooh, okay, Mr. Josh. Good job there. Okay. Good question. (laughs) Um, Loaded. Okay. So, um, I'll try to be brief. Um, so in my twenties, um, I was sort of, I was a very poor starving artist and I, um, would, yeah, right. You know what I'm talking about. I I would, I would, um, I would, I would meditate a lot. You know, I was a yoga instructor and everything else. And so I was kind of already developing um, sort of that, those non-physical connection skills. And I didn't know anything about ETs, but I just knew I was quite fascinated, you know, with that, with that type of stuff, but I didn't know that I had connections to any of that stuff. So when I'd speak with my guides or I'd meditate, I would get really beautiful messages. um, And, That led me to then give psychic readings and and mediumship readings, which luckily have been very successful. And and I've I've, um, been able to help a lot of great people and see the validity firsthand. It's just been like phenomenal. I can tell you stories all day long. But um, I remember when I first started asking my guides, okay, who am I? Why am I here? I don't feel comfortable, you know. You know, I don't have a connection with my biological family. I just feel so lost in the world. And I said, so who am I? You know, where am I from? And then I heard Ark, Ark. And they, of course, they speak quite peacefully, you know, Ark. And I'm like, what is Ark? So I had no idea what that was about. And then um, I probed them, which I normally don't. I, I tend to kind of just sort of accept where they are and see where it lies in my own, my own, my own world. But then I probed them and said, I want more information. Give me more information. And then they said, like, Andromeda. And I was like, okay. So the only thing I knew about Andromeda was some sort of like a I don't know, a show or something, I, something, I don't know. Um, but then years and years and years later, um, I then went into a doctoral program and we were at a, uh, an intensive in Petaluma, California at IONS Institute, a really awesome place. I highly recommend it. And while we were there, we did a past life regression. Now this was the mm-hmm. first one I'd ever done. And I was always under the interpretation, uh, uh, under the, um, uh, assumption that you know i was like you know a priest in other lifetimes or you know who knows i died of a drug overdose in the in the in the in the 1960s or 70s or something i don't know i just had these weird feelings that i was just so such an oddball that um but then also spirituality was a huge part of my life so i was always constantly asking questions so then when i did the past life regression I was with some really cool cats. We were all doing um, transpersonal psychology, really, you know, heady, awesome, cool people. And I did the regression and, the f- and I went in and the first thing that came was, did I say, I don't think I told you this, Robert. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a blue being. I looked down at my feet. That was Ooh. the first image I saw. My feet were quite large and I scanned up um, and my whole, everything was, you know, elongated and, and blue and quite beautiful. <sighs> Sorry, it, it, it's a lot. I looked up to the sky. The sky looked different. Things were buzzing. It was like weird lights were kind of flashing in and out. Little things were, it seemed like things were traveling. Um, and then um, then the next scene was I was with a, a woman who looked very similar to me. Now, this is the crazy thing, guys. Um, I knew that what I was experiencing was very real because... Um, I only felt four emotions the whole time I was going through this regression. And the emotions were so simplistic, yet highly evolved. None of it was the convoluted duality that we experience here on Earth, okay? So when when I was, you know, looking at um, this woman I was sharing my life with, I knew that I was sharing my life with her and that we were like partners, but it had no human attachment association whatsoever. It was just... We were sharing our lives together and everything was great. 
that's just like, it was such a high vibe emotion. It was just so great. And I didn't have to focus on that. I just knew in the moment. So I was with this woman and then I looked to my right and I had like three or four kids or so and they were beautiful and they were smaller blue beings and their joy and their laughter was um, really um, pure. It was pure. Yes, it was pure and not a single worry in, in the world. <laughs> um, and, I, and I knew this on an intuitive level. So there was, there was the empathy there. There was many other things that I had um, kind of cultivated throughout my life. And also I came into this lifetime having heightened degrees of, and then of course we can talk about the near-death experience and the out-of-body experience that really mm -hmm. brought me to the, these, these levels. But um, succinctly, <laughs> um, after that regression, ah, and then at the very end, the last scene, I was laying down on a stone slab and there was shapes and writing on the stone slab. And my, the woman was next to me and the children and they were all surrounding me like in a beautiful circle. And I was looking up to the stars and I knew that where I was going was very important. I knew that I was answering a call. I know this is the weirdest thing. It sounds like- Was, was this like a funeral sort of? Good question. Okay. Okay. That's what it sounded like. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. So because it's hard to explain in like human terms, there was a part of me that knew I was dying, but I wasn't dying. Like transition. Yes. Transcending. Yeah. And I was supposed to go into the stars. And now I also knew this too. <laughs> I knew um, that there was, I could call it in a human terms, a cultural understanding, uh, but, but it's hard to explain, of what, of what the stars were. <laughs> it was normalized in that yes. culture. This idea, the yes. human idea of death, that's yes. a human thing. To other species, it's yeah. not like, no, nah, he's just going to go on a convoy and end up somewhere else. He's just, he's not leaving us forever, just for now. Absolutely. Yeah. There wasn't a single ounce of any low vibratory um, emotion whatsoever. It was pure joy, pure understanding, pure bliss, pure consciousness, as, as pure as I can possibly imagine. And I knew that I was going into the stars. And I also knew, and these are the, the knowing was sort of this weird, intuitive knowing. Um, and I just knew where I was going was very important and that I would be back. And that's, that's, that's what I've held on to for a very long time. And I've known that for, for a long time. That's beautiful. Am I right, Josh? Like yes. I've, I've, Josh and I, we've talked to a lot of people and we, I've honestly never heard about the death process at all. I mean, that, once again, no such thing as death, but the transition process, I've never heard of an encounter and what you were saying our ideas, humans, humanity, our idea of our extreme emotions of love. You know, love is a thin line from anger and hate. It's yeah. not the same kind of love and purity. And really? what you were saying about you saw your children, you saw uh, your, your, your partner, because it's so much more than... Well, society tells us when I get this age, I need to have a wife and kids. They're not doing it for that reason. It's more of like a spiritual, a, a purity to it. And uh, that's an incredible experience. And after reading most of your book, I've not finished it, still working on it. But after reading it, I definitely see how you, those experiences that you just told Josh and I, and I haven't heard them from you before, I can definitely see where you drew off of those experiences and you incorporated this in a emotional way that humans would understand. Mm. Uh, it's a beautiful connection there. Now, Robert, I, I don't know if I was dying. I don't know that, but my the only way that my human brain can understand it is I was transitioning. So, of course, getting back to what you were saying, I just... I. <sighs> you know, this could be the envoy experience, right? Because I knew I was answering a call. I knew I, where I was going was very important. Um, you know, and I did uh, my uh, galactic astrology. I think her name is Julia Balaz, very lovely woman. I know, uh, I know her. Yeah, yeah. She, she's a cool she, uh, Yeah, she does the charts, the pendulum charts, and uh, with Elena. I just watched another interview with her. 
uh, great stuff. Uh, she's in tune, boy. She yep. is whoop, right there. <laughs> spot on, because I have now, like, paper proof, I guess you could say, that um, it said that my, uh, my, my first um, lifetime or my most important one was Arcturian. And then, uh, oddly enough, my last one, or so they say, was Andromedan. That, so that goes to when my team was telling me Arc, Arc, and Andromeda. So again, I don't know. All, we can, all, I, all I can tell you is what my experiences are. And I also know that the way in which I process the world, the way in which I've always um, felt about situations, people, the world, um, all of it corresponds to like the Ahorai way, the Arcturians, and also this sort of like very loving, um, intellectual sort of um, uh, philosophy that um, even the Andromedans utilize as well. So, you know, I don't claim to be anything. I'm just simply showing up and, and giving you my experiences because I know um, that they have been uh, quite um, odd to most people. Uh, and, you know, me being a gay man, it was very interesting that I had like a wife or whatever you want to call it. And you know, I have a husband here and what's that life sort of like? And, you know, how do I process the world differently as a gay man with my own experiences? You know, it's just so interesting. And Daniel, to bring this up, Josh, I, I don't know if you remember, but episode four of We Are the Disclosure. Yes, um, I remember. I was waiting for you to say it. R Rena Dunsworth. Same. I, um, she, she's a transsexual. Uh, sh she's a woman now. But man, but in her experiences she had in Lyra, mm. it was the same kind of setup. She, uh, you know, he, it was completely different. It, yeah. it, it wasn't, the relationship didn't meet who that person was now. Yeah. You know, it, it was so like left field out of there, but it, it was what it was. And she specifically talked about having kids, although she don't have kids in this timeline. And, yes. You know? And that also gets to um, kind of a, a lot of star seeds that I know actually don't really have a lot of biological children. You know, this is sort of a, a bit of a stereotype, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But I always, I always felt the call to take care of children. I wanted to adopt and stuff. But you know, my husband doesn't want that. And you know, you have to, you have to weigh options and stuff. But um, yeah, this this whole you know way of growing up in this world you were talking about earlier, the Matrix, where it's like you must do this, you must have the you know what, and it never fit me. You know, even when I was a small kid, I just knew. So thank you guys for giving me this opportunity. Now, if you don't mind, I can always talk about sort of that crazy near-death experience and then the out-of-body one that gave me more of an understanding of who I am as a starseed, if you'd like. Absolutely, and I do. Definitely. But before you go on to that, something I want to point out for everyone. Uh, you know, you were dealing with Octorians, you were dealing with Andromedans, and where things get a little confusing... Mm -hmm. Now, they come in all sorts of different colors, but a good majority of Andromedans and a good majority of Octorians, they're blue. Now, the Andromedans, they're more blue lighter. and purple's much taller, but it's air composition. Mm -hmm. Some of the Octorians, their blue is actually coming from their source energy that is coming out. And the Octorians are known as, like, being masters of universal spirituality, source energy. Like that's, they live and breathe it, you know, and they're known for that throughout the universe of being, um, having these unique takes on spirituality. And uh, they look at it in a pureness that I don't understand. Josh, you don't under, we, we no. can't because we were raised on this rock, but we can remember other times where we were closer mm. to having that understanding in our previous lives, timelines, dimensional phases, realms, etc. And um, I just wanted to make that point of how it could be a little confusing sometimes to understand what is a Andromedan and what is the Octorian and then a lot of times they're actually hanging out and partying <laughs> with each other so I mean it's uh, you know a blue being's a blue being but um, yes Daniel so uh, I know you and I were talking about one of your near death experiences which I've always been fascinated especially 
hearing a near death experience come from someone that doesn't believe in death. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so normally you don't get to hear that too much. You know, mm-hmm. normally you hear people talking about a near death experience, but like they believe in death as it's a such thing. So yeah, I'm sure Josh and I, we really want to hear this. And uh, if you're willing to, to share that with us, because I know that must play a role in your spiritual walk, your life. And, you know, is probably, would you say this was the experience, you know, what was that experience that clicked it for you? That moment where you said, there's so much more, we all have it. So was this, would you say this was that moment that clicked it for you? Boy, oh boy. Well, so my first, my my near-death experience happened when I was five years old. So it Mm. took me a very long time to figure out what the heck that was, because it was uh, um, a scene and an image and and a whole situation that that stuck with me for such a long time. I didn't know what it it was. Um, So that, but also to the out-of-body experience at 25 years old, that to me was physical proof that I have a team and they are supporting me, Mm -hmm. Um, physical proof. So getting back to the near-death experience. So I had cancer. I had had acute lymphoblastic leukemia when I was four years old. And I was um, being treated at uh, Duke Children's Hospital in in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I grew up mainly before I moved to New York City to pursue performing (laughs) as a job with actually my last girlfriend. That's a whole nother situation. Whole nother (laughs) ballgame. Um, you know, and that, that, that says a little bit about, you know, the Arcturians, um, they're some, what I've, what I've experienced is sort of the higher in density. There's this sort of androgynous quality that can exist. Um, and I know I do describe a little bit of that in the book with, mm-hmm. um, with the, uh, the, the angelic character and, or the being from the beyond. Um, okay. So, uh, four years old, I had cancer. Um, I had two times that my heart stopped and that my heartbeat stopped. But the one time that, that it was like proven, I guess that this was a near death experience (laughs) proven, but um, I was on the operating table and I was watching my body and it was a little darker at the time. I was a little bit of glowing light around me. I did see the glowing light around me. And I, and I knew that there was a very tall, male being next to me um and i knew intuitively that i was not supposed to look at this being because i would want to go with him like Mm -hmm. it's weird how you know things but how do you know them it's hard to explain in terms but you just i just knew that what i was supposed to do was to watch this scene and to make a very big decision and so the being next to me i felt very supported and protected but there was sort of this this purposeful disconnect where I couldn't put so much um, care into. I had to keep it a little objective, which, you know, with the Arcturians, they try to keep things as objective as possible while still showing this, you know, exuding this wonderful agape love. That's kind of what I was experiencing. And so I was looking at the scene, I was looking at my body, and I felt no remorse. I felt no sadness. It was simply like almost like a scientific observation. Mm. Uh, And again, five years old, it's hard to have the recollection of completely complex emotions at that time. The comprehension of it. Yeah, you only know. So while I was there, um, I saw um, people packing or nurses or whatever, medical professionals packing my my armpits and my groin and and legs and stuff with ice because um, my my fever was just way too much and then the heart stopped or whatever i was basically seeing this in sort of a weird multi-dimensional way i i guess you could say it and then um the being asked me um do you want to stay look at what you would miss or something like that Mm -hmm. and um then very slowly and gently the human emotions a little bit kicked in and then i thought to myself Oh, I'm not gonna cry. This is sorry, but um, I knew that I had a um, like a job or something very important, like a mission to accomplish that I didn't quite understand, but I knew it was very important. And so um, something kind of sucked me back into my body. And then the next memory I had, I was um in my um 
hospital bed putting together a puzzle. So I don't know how much time lapsed during all of that, but that simple situation is like burned in my memory. And then um, I only made sense of it probably two decades later when I had my near death ex or my um, out of body experience, which was really cool. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. And you were witnessing, you know, the, this process of, you know, this vessel turning off mm. and you were seeing it happen from like a different density, almost like a remote viewing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, seeing kind of that same angle, third person, right? Mm -hmm. Would you describe it as third person, this yes. experience? And the weird thing is, if I can kind of go back into that, I knew that, huh, I knew that I could feel every person in that room. And I knew that I could likely hear what they were thinking, but, but it was almost too much to, to, to really comprehend. So that's at why, that age. Yeah. So that's why um, I had to sort of succinctly tell you um, the, the highlights that I can express humanly. <laughs> so. And how, uh, I'm not sure if he said it or not, how long were you out for? What, what was the time period? You know, a, a lot of my medical history, um, my parents kind of kept from me because um, it was too hard for them to process emotionally and stuff. And there's, there's a lot of um, secrecy and, and challenges in my biological family. Um, you know, to this day, they still believe that um, it was the medication, the chemotherapy that the doctors gave me that is the reason why I'm gay. So, um, oh, wow. There's a lot oh. of interesting stuff going on so, you, you can't make it up man you no. can't make it up oh geez yeah so i just have to love them just just love them just I, love them. I mean if that's what they think if you think if they think chemo made you gay yeah. i mean i definitely understand how <laughs> their view of that experience yeah. may be a little differently so you haven't been able to hear as much now you have your memories of this situation yeah. which you know there, there are parts that are kind of a blur going back and forth and having this experience and then remember playing with puzzles and stuff in your mm -hmm. hospital bed you know um and it's hard when you don't have the adults that were the responsible ones talking to doctors you weren't talking to doctors mm -mm. You, you were unconscious you know like uh, so it, that must be hard now in, in your walk, in your spiritual path mm. and you're a guy that meditates a lot. Mm. You're a guy that looks in, have you been able to go back to that moment and figure anything out other than what you remembered physically? Yes. Thank you. So, and I love it. I, I knew where you were going. Um, in my memoir, um, it's called uh, Waiting for Life, um, uh, a cancer survivor's story of death, humor, and love. <laughs> There's always got to be a subtitle. I have to work on all that. Um, but it's a really great book. It's very, very, very nice. Um, that has been a collection of my journal entries throughout my life. And I've placed them into this really beautiful uh, memoir, this book um, that, people love and, and I've had a great blast um, uh, writing it and, and putting it all together. But I was able to have my guides help me figure out how to learn more from it so that I could put that into my book. And I did put that, um, that situation into my book among many other wonderful experiences I've had too. In fact, the out-of-body experience was in there as well. And it, and it describes verbally everything that, everything I was feeling, sensing, you know, what, what others were, were um, other, other people talking about or whatever in the room and stuff at the time. So uh, I'd, I'd urge you guys, if you're interested, you can always go to Amazon. I have a, an author's link there, Daniel Iseta, PhD, and you can find my other books. And would that also be on your website as well for those that go to your website? Yeah, but I'm not necessarily technologically savvy, not as much as my husband who's definite techie. Um, but, you know, he has his own job. So um, if you go there, you'll see it. It's danceda.com is my, my, um, my website. Uh, I would just urge you, to, if you want to buy the book, go to Amazon. But that okay, has that's yeah, the easiest. On there. Yeah, I'm still trying to, to do. I had a link. 
And uh, you brought up a good point. And with Josh, you know, Josh is really into the paranormal. Mm. And what, what you're describing here is something that kind of bleeds on over to, you know, the paranormal. And for all those people out there that, you know, um, believe in ghosts and weird, you know, spirits, energies that linger behind. After having a near-death experience and going through these emotions and processes, would you say that this has something to do with, for example, you were around and hanging out looking at your body, but you went back to it. What if you didn't go back to your body? What are your thoughts on that? I, I don't know. <laughs> wow, I never really thought of it like that. So you're talking about waywards, right? Wayward spirits, that sort of language. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, okay. So in, in a lot of transpersonal um, uh, research and stuff, uh, they do sort of talk about the void, you know, and, and, and even mentioning these words, people already, you know, have, you know, connotations of what these types of things are. But... Um, but yeah, people do tend to um, sort of extrapolate from their experiences certain iconic scenes or, or, uh, or, or images after they are clinically dead or, or, or pronounced uh, dead or their heart stop. And so sometimes there's this transitory phase that they talk about, which I have done a lot of near-death experience research on, and I have seen that. I guess you could say that that's what that was because I have heard accounts where people in emergency rooms have stepped out and, and seen their bodies. Um, so, so yeah, I guess there is evidence there. So wayward spirit wise, perhaps so. I have, Robert, guys, we could talk forever. There was one time um, I was at my grandmother's house. So my, my, grandmother, my grandmother and grandpa on my dad's side, lived in the, they lived in the Bronx in a brownstone and they lived there since the 1940s or so. Mm -hmm. So it has lots of old energy. Now, my grandmother went away for a little while, and I was cleaning up the place and sort of staying there with my dog, Charlie. Oh, no, no. Yes, I think that's the case, yes. Um, and so I was on the phone in the, the dining room with my chosen mom, Judy. She's this, like, amazing psychic woman. She's been my mother since I was 19 years old. And, um, and I heard these footsteps walking on, on the ceiling, you can tell when someone is like walking. You can just hear it, the creaking, mm -hmm. you can feel it. And I'm like, what is going on? Like this, it seems like there's like a 300 pound guy upstairs just walking around in, in the room. Now, my grandmother is your tried and true New York, Puerto Rican. She's got the, the, the blinds drawn. She's got the bars on the windows. Ain't nobody getting the in. Salt, the salt going around the doors. Yeah. <laughs> <She's> got, <laughs> the window frames. Walter Mercado on, I think at like, what, 8 o'clock at night, every night? No, I'm, yeah, it's true. Yeah. But so she was gone for a while. So, you know. Brojos. me and she, Yes. <laughs> El Gordo La Flaca. Yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, Judy and I, we... I've known her since I was 19. We did a remarkable things energetically. Um, she was the first person, I did tell you this, Robert, when I was sitting with her in, the, in, in the, her kitchen table, I saw the, this vortex like open up. It was like an aperture. It was like, and it was right next to her on her right side. Uh, and that was the first time that I was like, yo, there is a veil within this reality, there is something that we can touch, we are in contact with. It's just very hard to sort of understand it on a human level. There's yeah. other layers. Yes. And that's what and it looks like. Yeah. That layer is touching this layer, but there's a very thin line yeah. in and between we, it. We talked about that beautiful iridescent color, and then what was beyond it was just this like remarkable, oh my gosh, that's like that's like more home than this is, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I went upstairs um, in the Bronx house, nothing there, no windows open, nothing. It was dark. Wow. Yeah. I didn't feel anything too crazy. So I came back downstairs again and it happened again. And I'm like, okay. I was like, Judy, let's take care of this. So we did some meditations. We did the whole surrounding of the bubble of light. You know, we worked to basically transition this wayward spirit to the light. And it was amazing. So that I, I was maybe like hmm, early to mid twenties, maybe maybe mid twenties, mid twenties. So who um, needs the Ghostbusters yeah. when you got Merkaba energy, that source energy to help these Merkaba things? Bro. 
Yeah. Oh, wow. You got a real Merkin on right there. <laughs> it is killer, man. Oh, I love that shirt, man. Uh, this is for everyone out there, the new Order of Light Merkaba shirt. So we got nice. the hieroglyphics right there. Merkaba. Now, Daniel, that's interesting. So, Josh, I know you spent a lot of time, Josh, in the paranormal uh, field and stuff. Have you ever had an experience with, like, that the footsteps he's describing? Uh, yeah. This is probably pretty common. Uh, the the word poltergeist means noisy ghost in German. So yeah, they make noise. And yeah. I know when I, I I lived out in Gettysburg uh, mm -hmm. for a while, and that entire town is haunted, mm. and it's yes. uh, resi it's residual. I don't think these are like intelligent spirits. I just think it's uh, the minerals. Mm -hmm. uh, act like a battery there and mm -hmm. it's just replaying stuff from the past. I don't think they're souls right. because, I mean, you'll just be sitting there on the battlefield and see things oh, outside. But, some pretty horrific stuff happening. <laughs> you heard though too, man. <laughs> 65,000 people died in a span of three days. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> but in some of the older houses, you would hear someone walking, mm -hmm. but you would hear one thing I noticed specifically the old boots they would wear with the wooden heels, you would hear like the clicking mm -hmm. of that heel, which we don't have shoes like that. Maybe some women, their high heel shoes, but a lot of our boots are rubber, you know, Timberland right. rubber lining. Hearing that old wood click on those old wooden floorboards, it's freaking weird. And, you know, you were saying you were, you know, in New York, in an old district, an old area. And, um, it's uh it's something that happens i believe that the spiritual world and spiritual phenomena the ghost extraterrestrial i believe it's all on the same page mm. you know uh maybe different layers and different uh angles mm -hmm. of looking at each thing but how they operate it really seems to be um a common trend of frequency and vibration and one final question Mm -hmm. After you and her, you went up there, you put this positive energy up there, you tried to help whatever was there to move away. Did did it stop or did That's it continue? It absolutely stopped. It was the weirdest thing. And please note, it's it wasn't just, you know, I mean, my mind was like, what, was it a rat? Was it this and that? No, no, no. You know the difference. There is a mm -hmm. very large man walking, pacing the floor. And then while me and her were working on getting this being to the light, it sat on my grandmother's bed. I could Whoa. hear. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mention it. There's too much to talk about. <laughs> you could hear. <clears throat> and you and the spring in the bed, old beds, right? And then at that point, it was basically like listening to us. Now, our thoughts, our, our, our energy, this stuff is absolutely real. And then once, um, once we were working on what we were doing, um, she then saw him go into the light and we finished our, our situation, our meditation, whatever visualization and nothing, nothing. So it went from walking, pacing, and you could feel the angst and anger and heaviness and then sitting on the, the bed, listening, trying to learn whatever, and then going into the light. Like it's wow. a freaking movie. Wow. Man. Yeah. And we, Do you ever we bring it up to your grandmother? Oh. She she passed away, let's see, like probably 15 years ago or so. Um, mm. I wasn't able to make her uh, funeral, but I did um, write a eulogy that my, my cousin uh, said, and apparently there was like not a dry eye in the place. So. <laughs> a good eulogy, you know. Yeah. That, that's how you know right. you did a good job. If no one's crying, you, you missed the mark on there. You know, yeah, she happy was a tears. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that. <laughs> That's incredible, and it really says something also that, you know, we, as the vessels we are, have an energy in us that is actually able to help things that we may not be aware of. Mm. Now, when I say help, help things move on mm. or could also help feed a negative energy absolutely you have negativity anger you're feeding off this thing but yeah. if you're putting out positive and you said that there was some anger feeling which 
if you did get trapped in this lingo and you were stuck in an apartment somewhere in New York City for the rest of eternity, I would be a little angry too. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> it's that positivity, our light and manifesting that can actually help these things that are in other realms, you know, move yeah. on. Uh, that's amazing. And uh, this once again goes with the extraterrestrial side of things as well, because there are a lot of different sides and different kinds of beings that some mm -hmm. feed off of positivity and others feed off of negativity. It's just the way it goes. But Absolutely. that's an amazing experience. I know. Wow. And I'm sure that's not the only one. I'm, oh, no. I, I know for a fact, but... Uh, we will keep it rocking, and especially, uh, you know, this near-death experience. One thing I did want to ask you, Daniel, with, after having this experience, what was your biggest takeaway? Like, what do you take away from having a near-death experience? Like, holy, most of us, you know, I've never had a near-death. I've done stupid things where I should have died, but I didn't. <laughs> So I don't understand. And from someone that has had that experience, what do you take away from something like that? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I think that I probably took away more from my experiences in the hospital while, while feeling and knowing that my guides were always there. So the near-death experience happened sort of in the middle of my cancer journey for two years, you know, it was in the middle of that. So I remember knowing the entire time, as much as I can recall, always hearing the same message from my team. Everything's gonna be okay. You're going to be fine the whole time. So no matter what, you know, my mother was experiencing, you know, when she was able to be there, um, I could hear and feel what she was experiencing. And it, it, it made me very sad because I wanted to help, but I couldn't. Um, these types of things that like a young child kind of shouldn't have to think, um, but having the cancer, having all these types of things, it was necessary for me to um, kind of make me more sensitive and attuned to maybe carry out my mission which I'm hopefully carrying out and or hopefully sometime soon in the next years, decades, whatever. Um, but the takeaway was um, it's okay to be different and um, your natural proclivities um, of, of sensitivities and um, uh, empathy and telepathy and other things are very natural and normal. And you don't have to think you're crazy because you feel things that maybe other people might not be fully aware of. So I guess that's a takeaway. That's really interesting. And thinking about it, I know this is going to sound a little weird. Would you Never. say that your near-death experience actually allowed you to experience the joy of life without having that fear? Like once you went through that and you realized, ah, it's not that bad. It's not at that age what, I mean, you could only comprehend and what you were saying, having the cancer, being four or five years old, and, you know, a lot of people that go through these things, they've had a life, and they go through all the flashbacks of their life. When you're only four and five, you're not thinking about your past. You're thinking about all the things you'll probably miss out on the future. So would you say your experience, near-death experience, actually led to you to have a fuller life? I yes. know it's like an oxymoron, but is that what so you, you agree? You answered that better than I did, I think. Uh, and that's exactly what the larger takeaway was, because I remember countless times throughout my childhood and everything else, um, you know, people would tell me, you know, like, um, you know, like, why are you so happy? You know, uh, um, doesn't this bother you or doesn't that bother you? And I'm like, no, I'm like, I died. I survived cancer. I survived, uh, you know, an out of, uh, you know, getting hit by a taxi and, you know, being being lifted delicately, beautifully by my team in, in the physical sense. And um, no, none of that bothers me. You know, no, I don't really necessarily care who won the Super Bowl in 1990, whatever. I don't care about that stuff. Um, the larger picture is something that I care about. And I think that 
it's very easy to get caught up in identities and stuff here in this in this um, extreme duality in the third slash fourth density. Well, I don't know. We're still trying to figure all that out. Um, and that's okay too. But for me, um, it has been both, a I don't want to say a blessing and a curse, but it's both been both a triumph and a challenge to, to have the uh, experiences and sensitivities that I do. Um, you know, even in elementary school, um, you know, I would know certain things. For instance, we'd play this math game. I think it was called Math 24. And I was no prodigy, but I knew the answers before they even asked the questions. And so I would write down mm. the answers. And they, I didn't even have to show my work. It was the weirdest thing. They were like, how do you know this? I'm like, I don't know. So they, they wanted to put me to the nationals. <laughs> but I don't think I made the national team or something. But it was just strange how you, if you have these type of connections and stuff, and you, and you believe it and you sort of, um, it's almost undeniable. Um, and you step into that. Um, then, then you know, there's miraculous things that can occur. Also, um, feeling like an oddball my whole life has actually helped me. And this is funny now; they're kind of saying, "Yep, now you're onto it." <laughs> like an oddball my whole life has helped me step more into my role here, you know, and and to be able to write this book and so many other things, and to be able to touch people's lives because. I feel like we all kind of feel like oddballs to some degree, but it takes, yes, it takes, it takes the extreme oddball to sort of step out there and go, Hey, it's okay to talk about aliens. It's okay to talk about all this stuff, you know, show up, be present um, because life is short and precious. Exactly what I learned from the near death experience. So good wow. job. Brad. Yeah. That experience awesome. gave you a purpose, a mission. Obviously if you weren't dead and these things keep bringing you back, you're like, well, I could do nothing with that, or maybe they keep bringing me back because there is something I need to do, you know? And wow, that's a wonderful, just that's a beautiful, beautiful line. And Josh, um, do you have any questions pertaining to that? And yeah, are... so you were hit by a cab? <laughs> you want to fill you. us in on that? <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to ask, yo, what's up with this taxi thing and being saving you from getting hit from a cab? What's going on with that? Yeah, yo, tell Josh us about that. Mom. Love it, Josh. <laughs> no, great job, guys. Um, okay, so, so um, I had just taught a yoga class, a yoga lesson to a private client who I think actually lived at the Trump Tower <laughs> back in the New old New York place. City. Yeah, New, New York, York City. City. I think okay. it was on the west side. And it was around 33rd, I think. So I was I was I was on 33rd. I was heading east because I lived on the upper east side at this time. I believe I was mm, 25, 26, I don't quite remember. Uh, I think it's in my um my memoir. But um so as I was <laughs> I approached a um a, a major uh, intersection. Um, I didn't see the tunnel to my left. There was a, a, a tunnel where mm. cars were coming out. I had no idea. Uh, I was in my kooky, meditative, wackadoodle state, talking with my guides, per usual. And as I was approaching this intersection, I knew that <laughs> I knew that it was going to be. I don't want to say life changing because that. That tends to lead one to, to think certain things. But I just knew that something interesting was going to happen, okay? But I didn't quite know that I was supposed to stop or whatever. So, so anyways, I sort of was walking into this situation. So the pedestrian sign was, you know, stop. Everything was fine. I was a good New Yorker, just chilling. And um, the light turned red. Everything was quiet. You look both ways. You walk. It's, that's kind of the New Yorker. It was just before that the pedestrian sign popped on. So just before. But of course, the red light had already done and every, all the traffic was stopped. Um, so I take a step and then um, another step. And then um, the folks were about to begin to step off the curb. And all of a sudden, bam, this taxi comes. I was trying to, uh, to beat the red light, but it was way too late for that. Uh... So what, what physically occurred <laughs> was... And I found this out later because my experience was completely different. Um, the taxi hit my left calf, my soleus muscle, I think. My back slammed into the windshield, ruined the entire windshield like it was destroyed. Wow. Um, and they also said the front of the car was also like crashed in. 
And then I flew, you know, shoes popped off, the typical sort of thing. Yep. And I flew in the air and my head smashed and scraped and things happened. But what my experience was, was literally pure bliss. I felt a large loving being, and I know now it was my Arturian guide, with large arms, large torso, nothing, nothing too muscular, right? It was sort of a thinner frame, but it was still these loving arms. And I was in this weird um, state where, you know, if you do any research in out-of-body experiences, you, you hear this sometimes, but it's almost this like strobe light situation where like I'm in my body, but then I'm also observing, right? So this being picks me up in his arms, lifts me, and time completely stood still and just gently placed me on the ground, gently. That's what I felt. So I didn't a feel any- Very big contrast to what was reported right. Right from your point of view, the police report. Yep. Holy smokes. So, of course, the kooky uh, yoga person, starseed, wackadoodle I am, I listened to my intuition, and my intuition said, get up, sit in the median. And I got up from getting thrown across the whole Park Avenue, wherever I was, scraping blood everywhere. I got up, again, totally feeling nothing. I sat in lotus position in the median. <laughs> freaking kidding me. <laughs> but it happened, and then, so I'm there. What, what, what was your damage? Well, what do you mean? Uh, oh, I'll get to Physical. That. Yes. Yeah. So I'm sitting here chilling in lotus position in a state of pure bliss because I experienced something that was not normal. I felt this loving embrace in a timeless state that was just absolutely uncanny. And so I sat there in the meeting. I'm chilling. Blood is completely spewing out of my my uh, head. But again, sorry, I don't mean graphic. Oh. No, no, it's wild. It's insane. But similar to the near-death experience... I saw things very objectively. And so when the people came over, I knew, just like I knew when I was in my near-death experience, not to look at the guy, I knew not to look behind me because I would get distraught. So I knew to stay exactly where I was. So the people came up, they were like, oh my God, he's in shock. You know, are you okay? What's going on? And I'm like, everything's fine. I'm like, my name is this. I live here. You can call the police. Please call an ambulance. It will all be fine. Literally, like who <laughs> does that? I'm talking yeah. Yoda, oh. right? But that was the state I was in. And um, this, you know, things happen. It's in the memoir. It's hilarious. Um, but then at the hospital, this, um, this wonderful Indian woman, um, emergency room doctor, was actually picking stuff, um, glass and, and debris and just crazy stuff out of my face. And I felt nothing. And I told her, I was like, I have to tell someone this. I said, this is what I experienced. And she was pretty quiet. I could feel her. She didn't quite believe what I was saying, but that's fine. And then, you know, my, my uh, very funny uh, uncle came in and he took one look at me. He's like, only you, Danny, only you. <laughs> but the, the physical things that I experienced was, this is crazy. The Indian uh, doctor woman then sent me to this other uh, woman. Um, this, I forget what hospital I was at. Um, and after all the things that was done, she took one look over all my body and said, you only need one stitch on your forehead. And I was like, wait, was you, your, your leg was fine. Uh, your ribs. According fine. to the doctor, according to the doctor, everything was fine. And remember, I was not feeling any pain or anything. Okay. So all she did, and it was weird to watch her face because she was completely not believing the situation. She was like, this is not the same person that came in earlier. She looked at it and she's like, she took one little tiny stitch. I think it's right here. And um, there's one tiny little keloid bump there. And it was one stitch. And she sent me on my way. Come to find out later, I had a, a kind of a medium-sized bruise on my lower back. And my soleus muscle was a little tingly. But that went away in like two days. Even the gigantic mm. bruise from smashing in the taxi. Like, guys, this stuff is insane. Yeah. A uh, question I'm sure Josh has a few, too. Uh, in the police report, because mm. like you said, it was a yellow light. The guy was hurry up and flying. How fast was this taxi going? 
Now, I don't remember, um, but I do remember getting some kind of a notification. I remember back then, I was very poor. So I was sort of, you know, living all over the place. And then actually, I found out later, um, the Arcturians in general are, are regularly vagabonds, kind of, there's this vagabond sense. Where, <laughs> so we I'm like, care about hey. money. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm like, I'm normal, but not but normal. Um, so I remember getting a notification, I think it was paperwork, um, that basically said the taxi company paid for all of my medical expenses. Um, and I didn't need to seek any additional um, stuff, like everything. Reimbursements. Yeah. And, medical and there was attention. Yeah, no calls, no nothing. And I'm like, this was completely handled and I didn't have to do anything. It was crazy. Yeah, and oh, no permanent shit. damage, literally nothing. And how you didn't break your leg or, you know, really jack up your ribs because your back whacked that winch. I've seen real-time people get hit. I know the process, the yeah. hip, the leg, back, windshield, and a spin yeah. roll about 15, 20 feet, depending on how fast the car. I've seen it. And uh, you're fortunate. I think it's really interesting that from a spectator point of view, they just see someone getting hit by a car. But from a spiritual point of view. Quantum. Quantum point of view. That's even better. From a quantum point of view, it was one of your guys. And I, I, you mentioned God. You called Guy. But was this one of your blue friends? Well, I have my main guy um, is, the, is the Arcturian. And okay. that was him who was with me in the That um, was him. Experience. Okay. And that was he was with me in the out of body experience. Now I will say, remember, I, I am I am a um, you know a scholar, so I care a lot about evidence and and weighing all the options and stuff. The the best thing that um, I forget who said this. It could have been the ambulance person, the, the two ambulance people who 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 got me in. They said they said they were cutting off my pants because there was blood everywhere. Like like I was wearing hospital scrubs because like I think my aunt was a doctor and. Um, you know, and I got them free. So I was wearing hospital scrubs. Like, I'm so crazy. I and then, love it. Because I was already prepared, right? And, yeah, you uh, knew what was going to happen. I'm going to hospital anyway. Might as well wear some scrubs. But I remember uh, them, like, scissoring my pants apart because there was blood everywhere, but they mm -hmm. didn't, there was no cuts or anything that I can recall. Remember, I was in my own state of bliss, so everything was chill. And I remember them saying, you're darn lucky. I'm not going to curse, but you're darn lucky. Uh, you you uh, are, as, are as limber as you are, because, um, you know, maybe teaching that yoga class uh, saved your life. And that's their perspective. But yeah. They, yeah. they bring up a point. Right. It's almost right. like when a drunk driver, you know, gets in a car that no injuries whatsoever because your body is loose. You're doing wow. yoga. Also, also you are in a meditative state. You're you're as calm yeah. and at peace with yourself. You weren't you weren't angry. Oh, I'm ready to go to a metal concert. No, you were just really relaxed, drowning out the noise and the nonsense of the city. Just walking. After yoga, your body was loose from doing all the stretches. Mm -hmm. Probably did play a factor of why things weren't worse. On top of you having a little help. That's uh -huh. important not to ignore that. Mm -hmm. Just because it's not seen, there are things in other dimensions. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, universal butterfly effect. I know both of you have thought about this, right? Like what, you know, could, could a being do one little tiny thing, like drop an apple in their dimension? Mm -hmm. And would that cause like a uh, nuclear uh, <laughs> fallout in this country? You know, that kind of like butterflies. So there are a lot of other things going on. And, uh, you know, that that's amazing. And I'm thankful that you have survived these experiences and that you're still here oh, and yes. you're here with a mission and you're aware and you're able to go back and reflect on those things and meditative. I know um, you you did a regression with uh, yeah. Daniel Rekshin. Yeah, that was awesome. Right? Yeah. Josh, you know our boy. Yeah. Daniel <laughs> Rekshin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you did a, a, you know, a regression with him. I'm sure I know in your university you were doing it all the time, practicing on one another, right? 
It's a good question. No, um, I only had one uh, regression before, which was at the IONS Institute with my advisor and all the students and stuff. So it's sort of like um, a communal regression. And that uh, was the first one. That was the first okay. one. So uh, Daniel's was my second one. And wow. this was the pivotal one because it was, I think it took maybe three hours or so. I forget the time frame, but there were so many things that happened. And this might take a whole nother um, situation to talk about because there's a lot going on. Over oh, there. no. I mean, <laughs> we, we did a Sandra Newman's regression therapy, and that was a two hour special. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot and to really go over you have to explain it from start to finish that that will be a part two but but, but that was complete validation right there um within this regression because you know my 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 brain or whatever is sort of able to go to those states um pretty quickly and there was some um i don't know if you call it psychosomatic or there's there's several other you know terms you could use but when i was when I was actually between, I don't want to say between densities, but when I was really in, in, in close proximity to my guide, um, my body would vibrate and I would get very, very cold and I would experience these types of fluctuations in temperatures and stuff while we were doing all of this. In fact, this Merkaba. Cold. That, that's something new. That, that's a small little detail. I haven't heard before, so. Well, it wasn't as if uh, the room was cold. It was, I, I got cold. And in fact, I have a, a sweater here because it's like, it's like 76 degrees right now in my home. But when, so, uh, when I start talking sorry. about it, yeah. <clears throat> so like cold spots, you're no. talking almost like with, well, it was my whole body um, was vibrating a lot and I don't know what, um, what that does to the body, but um, internal, internal yes. coldness. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Not yes. external. That's what no. Josh. Okay. Okay. I, no, no, I no, it. man. This is exactly what we would have when paranormal investigating. It was like we would get cold if we experienced something. So it's just very interesting oh. to say, to hear him and, say that. And this Merkaba here was with me the whole time. And it was during the summertime. It was maybe two months ago when I did this. Um, and it was in, um, in North Carolina at, at my in-laws house. So it was a, it was a beautiful day. It wasn't cold outside. It wasn't cold inside. It was just, I was experiencing something very interesting. And this Merkaba was right next to me and the Merkaba that was right next to me got hot. And mm. there was a point when, um, uh, Daniel was uh, on, he forgot, he, um, mistakenly put himself on mute and I'm sitting here like channeling my guide and like talking about this amazing experience that was going on that we can talk about at some point. Um, and my guide tells me to stop and he says that Daniel needs time to, to fix some technical thing. So I woke up <laughs> and I go over and I say, you have to click unmute or whatever and so he unmutes and so i take my merkaba and it was it was hot it was really really hot oh and wow that was really cool and it wasn't in the it's sun either. yeah i see the correlation josh you know and uh whether it's something outside you know coming on to that person and making them cold like in the paranormal mm -hmm. you know you start getting experience and people get like cold from the inside out and your experience, but what I want to do is encourage everyone in the comments, mm. if you have had some sort of regression or you have been speaking to your guides, if you have had this coldness come over your body and this uh, electrical vibration, which Josh and I, we have heard that before from other experiencers who are, you know, going into that that area they described it as a vibration all over almost like it's shaking and uh but if anyone out there if you've experienced that please put it down in the comments because i think that's that's just those little tiny details i i, I well, love so much so wow it might just be it might just be the transfer of energy between two beings it's it's interesting yeah <clears throat> who knows well, yeah, look at what creates uh, heat, vibrational frequency, mm -hmm. lightning. Lightning's created by two different frequencies coming and rubbing and creating temperature changes mm -hmm. can create lightning. So if you're connecting to the light, 
Wouldn't that create temperature change? Mm. If temperature change creates lightning and we're tapping into source energy and beings that are in tune with this, I guess logically mm. it would have the opposite effect. And I, I have heard of people normally saying a warming feeling. Like some people describe that electricity as like a heat charge. Mm. But very interesting with the cold So I look forward to hearing others uh, you know, connect with that. That's awesome. And wow. also the palms of my hands, um, ever since I was a kid, are extremely hot. Um, I, yeah. Me too. Always yeah. sweaty. And my feet. And my feet. Yeah. Always sweaty. People hate shaking my hands. To all the fans out there, if you ever meet me in person, don't shake my hands. You'll be wiping <laughs> them like that. <laughs> yeah, they do say that um, they took uh, Caroline photography. There was, again, please note, I've, I've read probably way too much in my life of things, but um, there was some research done on um, uh, shamans or um, healers of some kind, and they did Caroline photography on their hands and found that um, a tremendous amount of heat uh, was was um, reported or was reported to to exude out of their hands. And then a spiral, a rainbow spiral in Caroline photography was 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 seen out of their palms of their hands. So when they say things like laying of the hands, you know, in the Bible and many other things, like these are literal things that can heal people. Our hands, you know, energy. <clears throat> it's like uh, our hands have the capabilities of an ark or the Dean's device, Josh, you know, uh, what mm -hmm. we were talking about with Chris O'Connor. Yeah. yeah, he got it right there. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's the same thing. And um, it's funny you say that because my hands have always been hot since I was a baby. And my body temperature is a little higher than everyone else's ever since I, I don't have a fever all the time. I'm just, uh, you know, a solid one and a half to two degrees higher than the average human being, uh, which yeah, it may have something to do with it. Yeah. My, par my partners have always said throughout my life, my adult partners, I guess you could say, is that I'm kind of like a furnace. <laughs> and, <laughs> and yeah, the, you know, in the bed, I'm always the one giving off the heat. <laughs> it's great in the wintertime when you're freezing. That's the right. summer summertime, they're like, get hey, off. I'm get yeah, go on the couch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> too hot. Uh, uh, that, that's funny. Well, uh, Daniel, uh, amazing stuff. And everyone out there, uh, we're going to start to wrap it up. But please go in the description. You will find Daniel's website. I will have a couple other things to make it easier for everyone. Also, down in the description, you will see Josh's information, my information, the merch store. Also, uh, to just give a little shout out with uh, the memberships, I got a lot of new members that are part of the page. We're doing the membership program where you will have exclusive live content posts. You get cool emojis and stickers and badges next to your name in comments and live chats on the page. Uh, so make sure to go check all of that out down in the description. Hit that like button, share it, subscribe. We have a lot more of We Are The Disclosure and new interviews and other videos that we'll, we'll be working on in the future here. It's going to be awesome. And uh, Daniel, it's awesome. We'll definitely have to do this again. I know uh, in the future, I would uh, like to have uh, you and Chris come on and do like a little round table discussion talking about all these awesome things. And once again, everyone, mm -hmm. here's the book Chronicles of the Octorian Envoy. Amazing book by Daniel A. Sada. PhD, you got to drop it, man. You've earned it. Uh, <laughs> hey, if you, if you got them, use them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so right. much you got them. <laughs> and it's a phenomenal book. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. I'm probably about 60 pages in. I did try to hurry up and read a little bit more before this interview to catch up. But I have completely been jumping through. Each chapter has a, a, you know, a topic, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, own thing is absolutely amazing i hope everyone checks that out also go show daniel some love send him an email if you relate to his experiences if you've had these same encounters reach out to him he'll love to talk to you and uh, hear your input and i really appreciate all the love and support from the youtube 
uh, community, the order of light family, and I'm happy that you got to be on episode 19, and we're getting it started, and this is the first of many great interviews, and it's been a pleasure, my friend. So glad you've been here. Thank you for sharing your amazing experience, knowledge, and testimony. Thanks, guys. Love you guys. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, right back at you. So, yeah. <laughs> We are the disclosure. Robert Earl White, that's what we're doing. Josh Myota, Daniel Isada, you know, getting it all down and dirty for the disclosure community and doing the groundwork that needs to be done. That means writing books, talking to people, helping people, trying to uh, heal people and help people move to that next density. That's what we're doing. Uh, you clearly survived everything you did, Daniel, because you do have a mission. And I'm so happy to see that you're fulfilling your mission. Although I understand sometimes it feels like we're failing. Mm. We're not. That's just the part of it. If no one said it was going to be easy. And the experiences you had in your past timeline of when you were probably getting set here to begin with, you know, um, it was a beautiful experience for the ones around you understanding it. But sometimes when you're the one that's on this rock, it's a different experience. It's a lot harder than the experiences before. So I thank you for being brave enough and strong enough and doing everything for uh, the disclosure community. Much love, brother. So, yes, uh, I hope to see all of you. We will have a lot of other episodes coming up throughout the week. Uh, we're going to be dropping more than one each week, and it's going to be a very productive schedule. So I hope to see all of you next time. We are out. Much love and light, everyone. See you all later. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Please join the YouTube membership for my channel. You will get exclusive badges, really awesome emojis, member-only live streams, posts, and chats, and connections with me for only $5.99 a month. See you there. Hey everyone, check out the Order of Light merchandise store. We got a lot of different t-shirts there. The Humans Aren't Real, Lower Always Creek Incident. We got tank tops and Merkaba. We got stickers, glasses, a lot of different glasses. So get thirsty. We got bags. I live in New Jersey. We don't have bags anymore. So it's really nice. We got flip-flops, hoodies, and all the ladies out there. We got a bunch of awesome merchandise for you. Thank you so much for watching. Please make sure to set a reminder for up and coming videos. If you have had an experience, please email us at orderoflight777 at gmail.com or we are the disclosure88 at gmail.com. If you would like to contact our special guests, information can be found in the description. Make sure to check out the We Are the Disclosure podcast radio on Anchor FM. For additional information, socials, and online store, go to the direct me link in the description. Whistleblowers, experiencers, and contactees of all backgrounds, now is the time to come forward. Please subscribe, share, and give the video a big thumbs up. We are not waiting for the disclosure. We are the disclosure. See you next time.